really flattering and an honor to have you guys, you know, be forced to read my books. Uh, <laughs> I think that's pretty awesome. So, who here, you know, enjoys reading? <laughs> All right, that's that's good. That's a good thing, I think, based on what you've been doing this week. Uh, me too. So. When I was a kid, actually, all I wanted to do was read. I considered reading to be a form of time travel. So I put my head into a book, and then I would sort of disappear for a little while, and then I'd pop out later. And so, yeah, I just remember, like, my dad always nudging me, you know, like, get your head out of that book. It's Mount Rushmore, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at it, okay, I saw it, all right? And then it's back to the book. And, and you know, I. Anything I didn't like doing, you know, I would jump right into the book. And I had a great childhood, actually, but I spent a lot of time time traveling, I, either, even so. Um, I remember walking home from the bus stop. I didn't like it. It was like a, it was a mile and a half or something. It took too long, and I was bored, so I would read while I walked, you know, until I hit my face on something, which happened regularly, actually. Um, you know, I loved it because every new book kind of introduced me to a new, cool world. And after a while, I kind of wanted to create my own world. You know, it's like a magic trick that you, you watch somebody do it enough times and you want to start doing it yourself. And I think if you do read enough, it's only natural that you want to start writing as well. And so I did write. Um, in high school, I wrote all these science fiction stories that I would give to my English teacher separately, and he would for free just uh, edit them, essentially. And he, he's very nice. He would give them back to me. He wouldn't make any sort of value judgments about it how good or bad they were. Uh, and I would send these stories away to pulp, pulp science fiction magazines, and I would always get these rejection letters. And after, uh, years later, I went back and I looked at the stories, and I realized that the reason that they were always rejected was because they were terrible. They were awful <laughs> stories. That was, the, that was the problem. But more specifically, they were, there was nothing unique about them. And so it's one thing to read a lot and then to want to write, but if you don't have something unique, something that you experience, either knowledge or just some kind of experience in your life, to put into your stories, then it really doesn't have a soul. And so a lot of what I was writing at that time was, was just derivative because I just loved reading so much I wanted to kind of recreate the things that I had already seen. But luckily, um, you know, I wasn't able to start out as a science fiction writer at age 18. Um, that's probably a really great thing for me. Uh, and luckily, I love science as much as I love science fiction. So I went to uh, study computer science. And for me, I thought of programming similar to, to the way I thought of writing, you know, because everybody has something on the inside that they want to express. And you have to have some way to get, to get it out, to show the world the stuff you're thinking about, right? Because we're all thinking about awesome things, and sometimes people need to know that there are spider tanks that could be walking around and just, you know, shooting people down. Um, and so, you need to really describe that. And so for me, oh, thanks. Two. Wow. I'm going to really get out of this. It's a horse over my chest that I got overheated. Um, and I will. I will. Um, so, so uh, I thought of programming was a way to express myself. I'd make video games, and I'd make all kinds of stuff. And, and show my friends. And so I studied computer science. And then while, again, I got very lucky to have an educator take an interest in me, and I had an advisor at the University of Tulsa, Dr. Sandip Sen. We always called him Dr. Sin. Um, he was S-E-N. He's a man. But uh, he showed me something called genetic algorithms, which just sound cool, first of all. And I'm not going to get into what they are, but they are essentially an, an, a machine learning algorithm. And what he showed me was that you can either program a computer to sort of solve a problem, or you can program a computer to learn how to solve the problem on its own. And that's artificial intelligence. And I was pretty much amazed with the, uh, the potential of AI, right? I, because you can apply this to almost any problem. And once you learn a little bit about something, this science, and you get a little ways with it, you realize that you can start using it to solve problems, and solving problems is really fun, like um, predicting horse races. And um, yeah, no, ideally you use your powers for good. Um, so over the years, I actually did all kinds of things. You know, I studied, uh, of course, I studied all the STEM stuff, and then I specifically studied artificial intelligence. I learned how machines think, and let's see, some of the stuff I did in grad school. Uh, 
I instrumented my own house with lots of sensors so that the house could figure out where people were at and what they were doing and build models of their behavior. And so then I would throw parties at the house and I would buy booze with my grant money because <laughs> it, sorry guys, use your powers for good. And, and be like me. Um, I also worked at Northrop Grumman, uh, which is a big military defense contractor. And I mean, they built big, scary uh, weapons and you know military stuff. And all the people that work there wear suits, and you have to get secret clearance and things like that. And then, and we built the most sort of harmless-looking little thing. It was called the rowboat, and that was a pun because it was a robot boat. Um, <laughs> and uh, it had a little instrument mast, mast with all these little sensors on it, and we would take it out and let it float around the water and freak people out in Pittsburgh. And then later they took the instrument mast and they put it on a navy cutter, like with machine guns. And after that I wasn't allowed to be a part of that project. <laughs> um, I spent one summer at the Palo Alto Research Center in the bathroom recording toilet flushes and, uh, with, a, with a microphone so that I could gather data so I could build an artificial intelligence uh, algorithm that could detect this like sort of unwanted bathroom noises, right? Um, it turns out you have about 300 milliseconds in between talking and the, the signal going to the tower and then being sent to the other person where you can fool around with the data, right? And so that's plenty enough time to take out the sound of another person peeing. Um, that's my contribution to humanity. <laughs> and still it's not available as a service. I really am not afraid to admit that I want that and I would use that. Um, so, you know, what I found out was that eventually the Robotics Institute, I went to Carnegie Mellon at the, the Robotics Institute there, which is a great place, uh, and it was really preparing me for more than just building robots and AI. Um, near the end of my degree, I had this idea to write a book called How to Survive a Robot Uprising, which was just meant to be funny, right? I was just going to ask my advisors uh, and, and all the professors, you know, what would you do if your robot attacked? And there are lots and lots of different robots that they're working on. Um, and ultimately, everybody cooperated with me, and they, told, and they, they played along with the game, and the, and the book did okay. And I, was at, I reached this sort of fork in the road right when I graduated. Actually, what happened was, I went on a lunch with the director of the Robotics Institute, as we were all forced to do uh, once a semester. He's a great guy. Um, and I was very, well, I was like 25, I had hair, and almost a PhD, and I had written a book. I was very impressed with myself. And uh, I told my, my, uh, the director, I said, well, you know, I'm leaving for a book tour. Yes, I'm going to be traveling around and selling my book. And he was like, a book? Did you write that at school? <laughs> no, I wrote it at home. It's not yours, it's mine. And he said, well, are you just going to leave school and go, write, and go on a book tour for like a month? You can't do that. You know, you, you can't just leave school. So I kind of looked him in the eye and I was like, okay, fine. And so I defended my thesis the week before I went on this book tour. And so both things really hit me at the exact, and I don't know where I got that energy, man. I wish I could figure that out. You guys, don't take a year off. You only have so many years where you have that kind of energy. Uh, take a year off when you're 80. That's, the, that's when you really need to find yourself anyway. You should be too busy before then uh, to, to be worried about finding yourself. Um, sorry, that's my unsolicited advice. I'm a father now, so I feel like I can dispense that kind of advice. So. Uh, so anyway, I reached this fork in the road where both of these careers really hit me at the same time. And I had the choice. It was an amazing choice. I could either do science and go back down into the basement and build robots, or I could write science fiction, which is kind of my first love, you know, the thing I always imagined myself doing. And also not have a boss and uh, not have to go anywhere um, and then just write about robots instead of really building them, which as it turns out takes a long time and involves a lot of math, too. Um, not that I don't love math. Uh, so I kind of, obviously you can tell, I chose science fiction. Um, and I went back to my first love. And so that's why I have to apologize to any engineers or scientists, because eventually I, I wrote a book called Robopocalypse. And as you guys know, it uh, does not really portray robots in the most positive light all the time. Uh, there are some good ones, you know, but mostly they are trying to kill everyone. Um, so, you know, all my former friends and colleagues from the Robotics Institute 
they're all trying to improve the worlds with robots, and then I'm just, I'm just like ruining it for them. So, as you guys know, Robopocalypse is a story about uh, people trying to survive when all of our technology fails and, and then starts trying to, to kill us, right? And a question whenever I wrote that that I was really interested in was, you know, can we survive without our technology, right? Um, and I think we can't. Surprise. So I, I think that creating tools is really the hallmark of humanity. I mean, making a tool is the most natural thing that a human being can do. It's, it's what we're made for. If you put a human being in the wilderness, the human being will die after one night if he, doesn't, if he or she does not build tools in order to stay alive. And so it's this really interesting sort of eon-spanning journey that we're on, right? The very first humans built tools. We build tools. People in the future are going to build tools. It's, it's the thing that really defines us as a species. But we have this real love-hate relationship with our technology, right? I mean, the more powerful it becomes, the more we depend on it, and that's scary. And in a lot of science fiction, I think we kind of externalize this fear that we have about this complex relationship we have with technology, and we just kind of place it all into one spot, um, the killer robot, right? And so it kind of makes sense that we would tell each other stories where uh, all of our fear of technology is projected into one killer robot, and then we just we shoot that robot in the face, you know, again and again, <laughs> until we prove to ourselves that we've won, you know, and, and we can survive without our technology. And I mean, I think you can tell from from Robopocalypse that I don't really agree with that. I think that's too simplistic. Um, and especially these days, when robots are real, I think we can all see right through those kinds of simplistic stories. Um, it's not really an option. We can't really survive without our technology. And you know, that's something I had fun with in Robopocalypse. You, if you watch the progression of the, of the heroes in Robopocalypse, you see everybody sort of gathers at, at Grey Horse. And the very first thing that happens is Osage Indians are challenged to accept a Cherokee into their tribe and, and, and to protect this person. And then people of all races. And then people who have technological upgrades, right? So they've got pieces of the enemy. And so the question is, are they going to uh, use that technology in order to survive? Well, of course. Um, you know, if the alternative is death, why not ally yourself with, with a cyborg? And then they have to go farther, further than that, and they ally themselves with freeborn robots. And when you get to the end, I've had like, people actually write to me and complain. Why is it a robot that saves the day? You know, why is a robot the one that goes down there and takes care of business? And I'm like, because that's the entire theme of the book. <laughs> uh, it's not an oversight, it's kind of on purpose. <laughs> uh, we depend on technology. Even in Robopocalypse, in order to survive this war, it's not a human being that goes down there and finishes it. It's a piece of technology that uh, sprang from a human mind at some point. And so, now I have gone on and, and had a lot of fun written the sequel to Robopocalypse, which is called Robogenesis, and it was released last week. Um, it picks up right where Robopocalypse left off. And, you know, at this point I've spent about 10 years just writing novels. And that's about how long I spent learning about robotics as well. So I feel like I'm kind of at this point where the two things are even. I've done like my Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours or whatever in, in both sides. <laughs> and maybe you're curious what my life is like as a, uh, as a writer, you know. So, Here's a little description. Uh, basically, every day I'm terribly lonely, and I'm at my house by myself, and it's like a sick day, right? All my friends are at work. They're, they're way past coming home when I call them at 3, and I'm like, hey, come home. We should go hit the bars, and, you know, they don't do that anymore. They know me too long. Um, and so, actually, I do. I go to a coffee shop to work, and at the coffee shop out there are these people that I call my faux workers. Um, it's another really funny pun. Um, <laughs> they uh, look like co-workers because I sit next to them with my laptop open, you know, and, and we work. But if you talk to them, it's really uh, awkward. It's not cool. So I'm not really allowed to just talk to the random people at the coffee house that I see every day. Um, my faux workers are cut off. So Unfortunately, I'm really excited about everything I write. You know, I'm constantly just looking at this, oh, that's genius, my god, I gotta tell people about this. 
So my wife gets home at about five, and so I'll jump on her, sort of like a dog, you know, that's been home all day, and jam pages in her hands and say, look, you gotta check this out, you know. But she's sick of that, right? She can't take that anymore. <laughs> so I wrote this, I wrote Robogenesis in 2012, and I had a, my daughter was two at that point. And I'm full of this enthusiasm about my, about what I'm writing every day, but I don't really get to interact with humans very much. And so this was like sort of a bad combination for my daughter's nanny, who was trapped in the house with me for <laughs> this summer watching my daughter while I was writing Robogenesis. And so every day I would, when the kid was taking a nap, sort of jam a few pages into, into my the nanny's hands and be like, okay, I just want to get the, lay, you know, the layman's perspective on this. You don't have to be kind of sci-fi, because she's like, I don't really like sci-fi. I'm like, I don't care. That's it. Um, and she's sort of a very gentle, quiet, nice person. And, uh, you know, one day she came back and she had the pages in her hand and she gave them back to me like kind of quick. And I asked her the question that I always ask her, the question that my wife hates because I've asked her this about everything she's ever read, multiple times, always. And it sort of also is a question that betrays a deep underlying sense of narcissism that is my personality. And uh, the question is, what was your favorite part? <laughs> I'm an optimist, you know. It's not like was there anything wrong with it. What was the just the, mm, the best? <laughs> uh, and so she said that day, she said, well, I couldn't read it, you know. So I kind of took the pages away and I looked at them and I realized it was a part where there's a robot that sucks the skin off a kid's legs and digests it, you know, as happens occasionally. <laughs> uh, if you don't like it, you can skim that part. One little part. Uh, so the first thing I said to her was, you know, whoa, I'm so sorry. Um, and I did that because it was sort of dawning on me that forcing her to read this might be some kind of like workplace violence. <laughs> More like, I don't want to go to court over this. You don't have to read it if you don't want to. Uh, and then, of course, the next question was, you know, up until the skin comes off the legs, what was your favorite? <laughs> I kind of loved it there. But, you know, so what I'm trying to say, though, is that the novel is, is pretty intense. And that's really what I was going for. Um, writing Robogenesis was different than writing Robopocalypse. Robopocalypse was like a magical unicorn, like in a magical glade kind of thing, because it was my first adult fiction. Uh, my first chance to write adult fiction, I had been writing a lot of non-fiction. And it's not necessarily true that they'll just let you transition, you know. Uh, they don't like that, actually, with the publishers. And it was magic, because I wrote 100 pages, and then I sold it to Random House. And I ended up with the same editor as, as Dan Brown, from whatever that means. <laughs> and, and then also DreamWorks bought it, right? And then I had this meeting with, with The Beard. And, you know, and all that happened, and I was like over the moon, and then I got home, and all the kind of adrenaline wore off, and I realized that I had to, a uh, half-completed first novel with a movie studio waiting on every page, and including like a living legend as well. And so it was a little bit of a, it was a little bit of pressure there that I had to deal with. Robogenesis is not like that, you know. This book came out a couple years ago, I had a chance to think about it. And I made Robo Genesis longer. I'm, I've spent more time with the characters, and you know it's just a little bit, a little bit more mature, I guess. I mean, someday I'll look back on both books and say they're crap because I will obviously have written something much better by then. <laughs> but it's today, and this is the best thing I've written. So.